Baba Yaga is the single most technically challenging movement in the entire children's art. So Baba Yaga is a Russian witch. She lives in a wood, in a hut with chicken feet. She flies around in a stoop and she uh, punishes little children who've been bad and disobedient. So this movement punishes pianists who did not do a proper drilling and practicing and whose staccato is not very good. So why don't we delve right away into this staccato problem. Many of the previous movements of the children's album have to do with staccato and we've talked a lot about how to actually do a physical staccato that is short, sharp and precise and the most important recommendation here is to avoid playing from the air. So you have to touch the key and then flick the key or poke the key, whatever works better for you. What you must not do is slap the key. Does not work. That doesn't even work for the sforzando notes, which have to be loud, but you can make them loud by simply arranging your fingers and impulsing your fingers into the key. The difficulty in Baba Yaga is the staccato is in both hands and not always simultaneous. The exercise that I would most recommend for getting these triplet staccato notes to go faster and more accurately is rhythms. This is the exercise where we're going to stop on each of the three notes of the triplet in turn and play the remaining notes as fast as possible. So here's rhythm number one. rhythm number two. And here is rhythm number three. The theory behind practicing in rhythm is this. In order to play fast, we have to practice fast. But if we practice fast, we're going to learn all kinds of yucky business, and aren't we? So the rhythms are best of both worlds. We play the fast notes as fast as possible, but only a few of them. And then we stop on the slow notes long enough to think and to figure out exactly what happens next. Not only what the notes are, but even more importantly here, is what the finger numbers are. It is very important to practice your rhythms with exactly the finger numbers that you're going to use to play. Here, it's not as simple as it sounds. Because of all the repeated notes, the finger numbers need to change. But we practice slowly. Sometimes the change seems like a lot of extra trouble for nothing. Oh, but it is not. So please do yourself a favor, get an addition with good fingering in it and um, follow it religiously. Or if your addition doesn't have good fingering, write it in, maybe in red, and also follow it religiously. Right? And then, of course, the second benefit of the rhythms is that we do get to stop on each note in turn so that your brain really figures out what that note is. Our brain actually loves to approximate where our fingers go. It's a very good adaptation for everyday life. As we go through our day, we cannot think with precision about everything we do. Our brain would explode before breakfast. But it is uh, not a very useful quality of our brain for us as piano players. So we have to kind of force our brain to aim the exactly correct finger at exactly the right note and rhythms help a very great deal. Once we've gotten the technical aspects here a little bit under control, we can start thinking about the interpretation, particularly the rhythm. The rhythm seems very straightforward, right? It's just six, eight, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three. But that's boring, right? So as always, when we have up-tempo pieces, which have areas of fast notes, 
followed by areas of long notes, we would like very much to exaggerate both. So here, the triplet eighth note will be a little bit squished together, but the dotted quarters with the sfortando on them especially will be a little bit longer. So instead of going four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, three, we're gonna go four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three. How cool is that? Sounds also much more frightening, which is sort of the point. Okay, which brings us to frightening. And um, I think a lot of the sfortandos here need to be judiciously considered. If you beat every single sforzando over the head, we're not going to have a developing story. So, for example, in the beginning we have seven in a row. That's a lot of sforzandos. Surely they cannot all be the loudest thing you can do. So, all kinds of possibilities here. Did you hear what I said? The first one was loud, second one was louder, third one was loudest yet, and then it all came down. So basically we had a baby sforzando, a mama sforzando, a papa sforzando, and then back to a baby sforzando. So that's just one option of many, but it already creates a much more interesting interpretation. In the middle section here, for the piano, piano is very difficult to accomplish with this many notes. So I would consider maybe using the una corda pedal if you can reach it. I think this piece is more difficult enough where it's not for a five-year-old with short legs. So I think most performers who have gotten to the, uh, to the level of this piece will already be using the left pedal, so I highly recommend it. This is especially important for the coda where the dynamic marking is pianissimo and probably you should add a diminuendo all the way to the end. For our picture or our story of the witch, this is where she is in her stoop and flying away. Or if you have been running away from the witch, you are now sufficiently far enough to be out 